Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And tonight we'll be, once again, going back into history. Tonight our guest is Professor Emeritus George Bailey, Columbia College in Chicago, who is also a Civil War reenactor. And so we're going to be and the, uh, the American and Indian War, right? So we will be going back into uh, the 19th century to talk about those times. And uh, George, welcome to the show. We've been here before. As a, in a different guise, you are also an author, a musician, a multi-talented Renaissance man, or I should say a multi-talented um, 19th century man. Right? Thanks. Um, thank you so very much for having me. This is one of the first times that I've had an extended amount of time just to talk to someone about my project instead of uh, acting it out. I, I normally put on these clothes and um, go out into schools. That's my, when I came to this, I started going out into public schools to do it. And so that has a history all in itself. Maybe we'll get to, get to that as we start talking about it. Well, what, um it seems, uh, from the outside, it seems like an unusual hobby mm -hmm. to reenact things that have happened 100 or more years prior, um, and, and particularly violent episodes, even though the Civil War, as we know, or the war between the states, so depending on your perspective, um, it was an extremely divisive event in American history, mm -hmm. and so Americans still look at it. Ken Burns' series, of course, was very successful. It's been re-shown on PBS many times. But what got you interested? What brought you to the point where you wanted to not just study it, but to be essentially a part of it? Mm. So um, I want to uh, uh, say that, first of all, um, the Civil War is the background to what I'm doing. So um, the Civil War, this, these uh, experiences of men were post-Civil War uh, in the Central Plains, in the Southwest Plains of the United States. It was the opening of the West. So after the, after the Civil War, I'm getting ahead of myself because there's so much. <laughs> Let me go back and do a little short chronology. Mm -hmm. Please okay. do. Uh, in the, uh, but in, even before the chronology, I need to say how I came to it. So my wife and I, you know, we were, we were both teachers in the early 70s. Had no money, but we had lots of time. So we would get in a car and drive all the way across the country in a car. One of our journeys took us to Wall Drug Store. The famous uh, Wall Drug. The famous Wall Drug Store. The guy started out selling ice water to people coming across country. And he's in South Dakota? South Dakota. Dakota. Yes. Right. And... His store just it's like a shotgun house. You keep adding on rooms to it. And uh, I, we, we were there, I can't remember what year it was, but it was um, early 70s. We stopped there to get some water, get some gas, look around the curio shop. My wife hunts rocks. She makes jewelry out of rocks. And I found this book by a writer named William Leckie. It was called The Buffalo Soldiers. And it was the story of the black military experience in the Western expansionist movement. Post-Civil War. Post-Civil right. War. Post-Civil War era. It, it, uh, okay, and another thing was happening uh, at, at that time, traveling on the roads, um, vacationing, there were very few, I saw very few African Americans in the West, very few in the, in the 70s, because, you know, we'd, we'd go to Montana and Wyoming and, you know, the, the big sky country. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a curio because very few people had... Uh, had was it a, a respected it was curio? Very, you know, some were, some were. Most, most, most of the time it was very, very, very respectful and uh, I learned a great deal about people. You know, I really did. Um, but this, this, this one time when I went into the store, I was really feeling the absence of people of color, except for the Indians. You know, and we mm -hmm. there was a kind of relationship between blacks and Indians because of 
the issues going on in, with the AIM movement, the, the mm -hmm. American Indian movement. And, um, but I picked up this book, and it was a complete history of the Buffalo soldiers. And I said, Buffalo who? <laughs> Buffalo what? Who were these guys? Who were these guys? And they were all black men, you know. So I went back into the history of the Civil War, because I started with the Civil War. And here the, here's an important date. So in um, 1866, by an act of Congress, six new regiments were formed, all black, two cavalry, four infantry. The two cavalry regiments was designated the 9th and the 10th, the 10th cavalry. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were, uh, over time, they re were reorganized into larger units. I think there was 11th Cavalry that was Buffalo Soldiers as well. But the two infantry units were, were I think it was the 37th and the 41st. They ultimately became the 23rd and the 24th Infantry. And they did the same kinds of post rotations that the Cavalry did because uh, infantry on the mm -hmm. Western Frontier what was a post-rotation? Okay, a post-rotation. Okay, so after the Civil War, which is a huge another story, after the Civil War, um, let me just say this. Before the Civil War was over, there had been uh, American forces in the Southwest. Not a lot. Uh, and they you mean were... Northern forces, not Confederate right. forces. Right. Well, uh, Right, right. After the war, there were Confederate forces. In, after and during the war, there were Confederate mm -hmm. forces in the Southwest. Uh, and there are stories of Confederate forces and Union forces joining up to protect themselves. Against and, and irony. the against Indians? The, against the Indians, and against the elements, against mm -hmm. hunger, against mm -hmm. thirst. Lots of, lots of stories. But um, the, 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 the Union soldiers who ultimately became uh, Buffalo soldiers by this act of Congress in uh, 1866, um, uh, in these two regiments, the cavalry, so I'm going to talk specifically about the cavalry mm -hmm. now. You, you talked about post-rotations. Uh, there were a lot of installations built in the southwest along routes to protect. For forts, essentially. Forts. Right. They were forts. And they were built because the Europeans were flooding into the United States. Taking over. Taking over the Indian land. You know, and the government, the government actually really wanted people out there to subdue the biosphere. That was what it was all about. There are lots of stories about that, how that worked. What did it mean that, that you had a whole new culture on the southern plains that had no notion of who the Indians were, except that they were savages. They were enemies. They were enemies. You know, they, they were viewed as having no culture you know, by a few people who... No history, who knew, knew no society. History. Right. So um, the, uh, the two cavalry units, and I'm going to talk specifically about cavalry now because I'm representing a cavalry unit, were designated to the 9th and the 10th Cavalry. Um, and they were formed in different places. So the 10th Cavalry was formed at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, by a Illinoisan uh, whose name was, um, oh dear, I'll come back to him. <laughs> <laughs> but the 9th Cavalry, the 9th Cavalry was formed by uh, two uh, really capable uh, Civil War veterans. One was named Wesley Merritt. And the other one was named Edward Hatch. And Edward Hatch had really distinguished himself in the Civil War. He actually, uh, he was actually a part of that, that the, the raids on the South that broke the backs of the of this, of and this these Confederacy. And these were African-American officers? No. They were white. So that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, officers could not be black. The, the highest rank mm -hmm. that you could attain in uh, uh, a black unit 
was sergeant, right? Uh, you could not become a lieutenant, uh, although there are a couple exceptions, and I, I hope to get to it by... We only have 30 key. minutes, though, okay. so we'll, we'll, <laughs> right. we'll, we'll have to be more direct. Okay, right. okay, I'll be more direct. Um, so uh, uh, the 9th Cavalry was formed in uh, Green, Green, uh, Greenwood, Louisiana, right outside of New Orleans. And a lot of the people, it was first thought that a lot of the men who um, uh, were a part of that organization were slaves. Well, and a lot of them were, you know, they, you, they just didn't know how to read, didn't know how to write, but, but they, wanted, they wanted their freedom. And so... Was that a deal that was made by the Army? That, that, I mean, even, even though the war had ended. The war had ended. But still, the question of freedom was still very much oh, yeah. open, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the, the deal was that join these regiments, go fight the savages out in the western states, and you'll attain your freedom. Is that, was that the bargain, essentially? Uh, mainly, uh, there's a historian who sums it up, uh, Don Hickey, Ricky, Don Ricky, on his book, 40 Miles a Day on Beans and Hay. <laughs> That's the name of the book. And uh, you, you earn $13 a month. Got a uniform as a, as a cavalry member, mm -hmm. $13 a month. Well, and at the time, it's hard to know whether that was any. That was, that, was, that was probably not a lot of money even then. Right. Well, actually, to some to someone who had no money at all, that, okay. $13 a month, food, a uniform, um, and I'm jumping ahead of myself. Uh, Colin Powell, when he when he. Um, uh, when he went to Fort Leavenworth to commemorate the Buffalo Soldiers, the 10th, and I have to get to the 10th, um, he said that if you put an eagle on their breast, you know, give him a brass button with eagles on them, they, they change their whole demeanor. They're transformed into men. And was that, was that true? I mean, just showing that recognition? In a, in a way, in a way it was. In a, in a way it was. So the 9th Cavalry was formed just outside of New Orleans. The 10th Cavalry was formed uh, in, in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, by another Civil War veteran who uh, led a famous raid. And I, for the life of me, I don't know why I'm having a block on his name. It's because you're on TV. Thanks. George. If, if we were anywhere else, right. you, would, you would remember this. I'm going to blurt it out in a minute. <laughs> okay, so getting to this point, to designate these two regiments of cavalry, and a regiment, you know, it, it c contains about a thousand people, and they're bro broken up into troops and companies. So there may be like 70 men in a troop under a company flag, you know. So, um, and uh, when uh, a lot of the men who joined up in, from the 10th Cavalry were soldiers who had fought in the Civil War, the First Corps. There were a lot of black soldiers who fought in the Civil War. So is this a, a primary difference between the 10th and 9th, that the 10th was composed more of veterans who had fought? Yes, the 10th was okay. composed more of... Now, what, were, what was the motivation of the, the white commanders? Right. Why would they do this? Right. Well, some people speculate that it was not all... Um, altruistic. Altruistic. I, I'm uh, not. I'm not shocked by that. By no. Way, but, yeah. But I mean, it's, I'm trying to think of what would be the reasons they would want to do that to collect these groups of of black soldiers or or, or even just freed slaves, mm -hmm. and and what was the advantage to them mm -hmm. doing that over simply enlisting um, the whites or, or whomever else they could get to to fight against the uh, the Indians? Well, the. Uh, the country now had moved and fought a war over slavery. They had fought a war over slavery to make black men equal. Mm -hmm. And black men had demonstrated by virtue of their performances in many battles, most notably the Battle of Nashville, where actually Wesley Merritt performed uh, to, in, in a, just in, uh, the, highest, the highest capacity of a soldier. Uh, for the Union Army, and that and was Merritt, one reason. Merritt was the fellow who, who founded the Tenth. Hatch, right? Hatch, oh, Hatch okay. was a guy who founded the Ninth. Mm -hmm. Okay, the 
tenth guy I'm trying to remember. Gotcha. Um, but but your question is really a, a really important one, and people are still arguing it. So here you have a situation: you have almost two hundred and fifty thousand black men with guns in the United States after the Civil War. 250,000 men with guns. A very scary proposition very to scary the white proposition. population. Yes. Right. Now, that may not have been the real reason, but I, and I've been looking for it. I can find no other reason other than the fact that the federal government wanted to recognize the value of black soldiers as men because, you know, black men were animals. Mm -hmm. To be yeah. sold, bought and sold, right. kept. Right. So was it that that drove the altruism or the, the sort of the respect or the payback, and we were going to create units, specific units that were all black units, because these guys had demonstrated they could they could perform in in, in uh, combat, or was it? We want the land. We want the West. And we have people coming into the West. We want to, and there was an Indian eradication policy. It, people made no bones about it. An Indian eradication policy starting from like 1868, ending with the ghost dancers at the Pine, w w Pine Ridge Reservation in the uh, 1890s, I think. The ghost dancing. So the, was, the this, dancing. was it considered that these black soldiers were more expendable than the whites and it was easier to send them off into the wilderness to fight the savages? Well, you have, yes, I mean, you have to understand it. this is 1866 when this, mm -hmm. was, this happened. This is, was this a year and a half, two years after Lincoln is assassinated? President Johnson, who was uh, not a very good president, and, and Ulysses S. Grant is becoming, is going to become the president of the United mm -hmm. States, who Ulysses S. Grant and Sheridan in the Civil War, they were the guys who really broke the back of the Confederacy. So you had a guy like Ulysses S. Grant creating these commissions for guys to become infantrymen, cavalry. and. Uh, and so he was a soldier and thought like a soldier and, he was, and knew the value absolutely. of these fighting units. Absolutely. And so there's, so there's a real possibility that, that their motivation may have been a combination of a number of things, one of them being purely military. Right. Grant, having been a successful general and s having seen what these soldiers could do, thought, look, now I've got a bigger problem or just as big a problem out west. Let's take these guys who know how to fight right. and send them out there. Right. And simultaneously, it could also solve the problem of, what do we do with 250,000 armed former slaves who might not be very happy with us right, right now? Some of, some of the men who fought in the Civil War were actually freemen. And uh, it, was, it was due to the credit of uh, Frederick Douglass that black men got into the war. Uh, 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 Lincoln really was not sure about um, whether or not they would make good soldiers. Also, uh, the soldiers who fought for the, U for the Union, a lot of these guys were young Irish boys, off the boat, no job. No education. No education. And they died by the thousands in the Civil War. So there were, I, I didn't live in the time, and my only entree to the time is the histories that are created. But you, you know, um, in New York, there were riots about whether or not young Irishmen should be fighting for black slaves, right? Mm -hmm. There's a great movie about it. Uh, Gangs, sto of stories New York, Gangs of New York. Right. Gangs of New York. Um, so, so, the no so, so, so the two regiments of cavalry have been formed. They went through basic training as well as they could. They learn how to drill. They learn how to march. They learn how to mount guards. Uh, they learn uh, horsemanship, um, and they went west. They went west. They went west into the Indian Wars: Oklahoma, Kansas, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas. And those wars you know, went on for decades. Those were two decades, two and a half, maybe three decades and probably still going on today. In some respect, yes. Yeah, still going on today. Now, So, it, you, though, as a, as a reenactor, what do you get? I mean, uh, you talked about studying mm -hmm. the history, and you can study the history. What do you get from this reenactment that you don't get from reading it? And you, as a professor, you know, mm -hmm. from studying it and understanding it or even teaching it, 
what do you get from reenacting it, being able to wear the clothes that, well, actually we'll have the camera pan around in a minute and take a look at those. What do you get from that? Um, to tell the story that's never really been fully told. You know, as a writer, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I look at stories, and his, like the history is incomplete. It's an incomplete history. My first entree to the history of the, tenth, uh, by the, by the Buffalo Soldiers was through Edward Leckie. Uh, William Leckie, mm -hmm. who's, uh, who was a professor at um, the University of Oklahoma at, no at Norman. And his book has become a kind of uh, bookmark to other uh, historians. And since his book, a lot of people have gone out and done the research. So we find out that actually in the s Southwest during the Indian Wars, one in three trooper was black. One in three. You know, you don't hear that in the history. No. You certainly don't see it in the Westerns. You don't see it. It wasn't in F Troop, for example. No, it wasn't in F Troop. No. Uh, one in three. And, uh, and they had these really amazing jobs. So they rode a uh, patrol. The, the, the Buffalo Soldiers, infantry and cavalry, they patrolled an area from the Mississippi River all the way sometimes to the, to the, to the California border once you get past Nevada and getting coming to California. They did lots of patrols into Nevada all the way to California, down to the Rio Grande, all the way up to the Canadian border or to the Rockies sometimes. So and they rode, they rode, you know, the various units rode these patrols. So one would think that having, uh, that the soldiers having spent that much time in the West would then have been likely to have settled there after right. their service was finished. But did that happen or, or not? Lot, a lot settled. Many, okay. many settled. But, uh, but because the, so, I mean, their jobs, they, they, they were, they protected the railroad. railroad. The, but the reason I, I say that is because you mentioned earlier in your car trips with your wife that you would go to these western states and there were no people of color. Right. Right. Um, and yet there was this huge force of armed men who theoretically would have settled there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But there doesn't seem to be uh, an, enough evidence now today that that happened. Well, in Denver, like one of the, one of the largest uh, uh, African-American uh, population in Denver, Colorado, um, uh, when the slaves move uh, from the southeast to the southwest, and they moved a little north. There's a town called Nicodemus, Kansas, which is an all-black. So there are lots of very small little all-black towns, mm -hmm. but they're but they're not they're they're not really populated uh, because one, the the Europeans wanted the land for the Europeans, mm, right? And um, uh, in some ways, the Indians were viewed viewed as same as blacks in some ways. Even though you know, the blacks and Indians had fought this right. decade-long war, decades-long war. And fought in the Civil War as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, we're getting near the end of our time, and I don't want to lose the opportunity to talk about some yeah. of the wonderful um, uh, gear that you've brought along here. So we have separate uniforms, two uniforms, a great coat, a hat, some gloves. So talk a little bit about this okay. and where it's come from and what yeah. the significance is. This is a... This is the uh, everyday field uniform, and uh, Let's turn that slide about ninety degrees this way. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and um, uh, when I was researching the character I would become, I chose a corporal because they do all of the work. <laughs> Corporals do all of the yeah. work, and you know they're between a sergeant and a private. But these pants here, they took away the wide yellow stripe. Uh, during the Civil War, and they get, they created a little um, yellow stripe on a blue field uh, to uh, distinguish the uniforms from the Civil War uniforms. And those those are all heavy wool, by the yes, way. Yes, right? yes, yeah. heavy so, wool. Heavy. So in the warm weather, yeah, yeah it's no, dark, no. it's wool, um, and okay. it's uh, I imagine it was sort of a uh, it was a task to wear that stuff, right? Uh, this is the hat. Uh, most most people, when they think of messed up, you think of there. Most, <laughs> most most people, when they think of uh, uh, hats of cavalry, they see white ones. Mm -hmm. uh, they they had black hats. This is my parade uh, 
jacket, my parade now, tunic. Me, so the Buffalo soldiers had black hats, but yes. did, but the regular the uh, the white soldiers had white hats. Right, right, right. Most units had white hats. Just in case you missed the fact that they were blacks, they, their hats would distinguish them. Uh, well, yeah, and 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 the hat actually uh, uh, the guys who uh, worked with the quartermaster corps uh, wanted to have black hats. Uh, yeah, uh, my canteen, one of my. It's a real replica of a canteen. They didn't carry a whole lot of water. Uh, people were smaller, you know. Uh, these are my gauntlets, you know. When you uh, say throw down the gauntlet, throw this, down is, the gauntlet this is what you know. you're talking about, right? right. And um, I wanted to, um, this is uh, one of the, the firearms that was most commonly used uh, on the Western Plains until the Colt revolver. This is an 1851 Navy Colt revolver. It's not a real gun, although it looks real. So uh, it can't be used. Can't be, can't be used. Let's take can't be used. So. It's pretty heavy. Um, so, what was what was revolutionary about Colt? Colts uh, that you could get, you could get, you could uh, carry the cylinders because hmm. this, this cylinder came out. So you can so carry a bandolier cylinder. Yeah, right. And you pop the cylinder in and you could uh, You're ready to go. have, yeah, you right. And they were, because uh, it took some time. This is a muzzle loader, black powder. Uh -huh. It's a muzzle loader. And it, it takes a little time to. Uh, so you'd prepare your, you, your you, cylinders ahead of time. Yes, yes, And you then would. just take them with you. Yes, yeah, they're pretty heavy. Okay. So you guys would take like four or five or six of them. Yeah. You know, um, and. Um, this is my long, my long, my great coat. Okay. It's my great coat. And um, uh, one of the interesting things about it is that it has a, a cape that soldiers could use in dust storms. Ah. You know. And once again, it's heavy wool. Heavy right. wool. Heavy wool. I'll just leave it there. So uh, I didn't bring the saber. The saber is always <laughs> popular, but I did bring the saber. Um, um. Because yeah. it is, that is a real weapon, and you'd be traveling on the roads with real weapons. And That's right. You never know. So. Um, there's so many things I've left out, you know. And I have to tell you that the commander of the 10th Cavalry, his name was Benjamin Grierson. He, he lived in Illinois. He was a music teacher, and all of his papers at the Newberry Library. Still, and they're still all there today. all of it. His regimental returns of the day, uh, the letters to his wife, and he was always constantly writing the president to get new horses, blankets, shoes, because the white units got uh, all the good stuff. All the good stuff. Right. right. So um, the, uh, we only have about a minute left. Um, so what is the, the in, in a short phrase, what's the one lesson that you want our viewers to take away from the Buffalo Soldiers? Um, is that they, they really did their duty in a very trying way, and they suffered from the idea here we are newly freed men enslaving red men. And it was a struggle for all It was all a struggle. It was a real struggle for them. Dr. Bailey, thank you so much My for being joy. on the show <laughs> one more time. My and uh, we'll have you back again. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll dress up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll count on it. Okay. So, and thank you for, for watching once again a Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. You can find us every Saturday night at 8 on Comcast Channel 19. And you can find us on the web at publicperspective.tv. So until next time, thank you and good night.